my name's Stephen. Uh, I've been here yeah, a couple of weeks now, and it's lovely getting to know you all. And uh, we have started uh, just the, the preaching ministry side of things, going through uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, and we titled that uh, preaching series, uh, Called by God. Now, if you go through the first introduction, what you'll find is Paul uh, talking to, to the church there, and he is saying that he is called by God to be an apostle, that they are called by God to be his people. And, and being called is you're elected. If someone calls you up, it's not because you got a hold of them first. God got a hold of you first. And so Paul is saying, look, you are called by God. He elected you. And there's certain things you need to know about him and about his will. And that's what I've come to share with you because he sees that there's problems going on in the church. The first week we looked at uh, godly wisdom, that God calls you to be wise in him, who he is and what he's about. To know his will is to be wise, not only to know his will, but to also do it. But the godly wisdom that Paul is really portraying here is the wisdom of the gospel, that it is grace, that it is freely given to those who would believe it by faith. And so in the first week, what we looked at was that godly wisdom produces unity. You see, we all come to God on the same plateau. There is no one more superior than another when they come to Jesus Christ. So what that should bring to the brethren is unity a oneness, a humility before one another. Last week, what we looked at, what Pastor Jonathan uh, spoke at at the induction service was that godly wisdom, sorry, I've lost my page here, uh, is for the humble. You know, arrogance and pride cannot receive the gospel because the gospel says to you, you cannot work for it. You cannot attain to it. And so all your bad deeds... And all your good things that you think that you have before God, God says they're nothing to me. In fact, what you don't need is your good works scale. What you need is forgiveness. Because you're a sinner in the lines of being condemned and you need a good God to bring you to the forgiveness. And this is the gospel that he holds out. So arrogance cannot receive the message. We must come humbly before the gospel. This week, what we're going to be looking at is that godly wisdom will produce in us spiritual maturity. That's our title for today. Godly wisdom will produce spiritual maturity. A question uh, that it begs, these scriptures beg for us to think about is, who is a spiritually wise person to you? If you, if you had to point to someone or someone in your past and go, that, that is what it looks like to be spiritually wise now don't go all saying oh it's jesus that's the bible school answer all right i want to know who in your life would you choose as someone who is spiritually wise if i survey my own my own family my own friend groups and and the spheres that i've been in i see people searching for spiritual knowledge or or spiritual wisdom in in lots of many places now, I've got some people that are looking for it in, in, in rocks and, and in gems and in stones or crystals or whatever. I've got some of my friends, they go looking for it in like a, an ancient Eastern practice, hoping that something that was lost long ago or maybe Greek philosophy, some knowledge, some wisdom that was there back then has somehow been lost and we need to go hunting for it today. Maybe then I'll have some understanding. I've got other members that look for it in star signs or or horoscopes, people go to other religions, people are just thinking, well, the answer will just be inwardly. If I internalize enough and I think through it enough, that's kind of the philosophical bent, I will get to this knowledge that I'm trying to find. And so all these people are hoping that there's some pathway that has maybe been done before where they can go and they can seek and they can attain. And finally, they've reached that end of that quest, that revelation or whatever it is that they were looking for, to finally bring them to God, to spiritual maturity or a spiritual understanding. What we're going to find this morning in the first section of our text as we read through that spiritual maturity and knowledge, it has to come from God. That's where it's placed. You want to go looking for spiritual wisdom or spiritual maturity, look for God. Let's read chapter 2, 1 to 5. Paul says, when I came to you, brothers and sisters, announcing the mystery of God to you, I didn't come with a brilliance of speech 
or wisdom, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might be based on human wisdom, so that your faith might not be based on human wisdom, but on God's power. You would never picture it, if you, if you read through the, the story of Paul, he seems like a very zealous dude, he's that kind of, he's got that character, you just, you can't help but love him because he is so focused on his mission, he's so focused on his cause and he looks to be completely unwavering in his conviction. But actually when he gets to the town of Corinth and what he is saying here, he says, look, when I came to you guys, I was fearful, I was scared. And in fact, he was also alone. If you go read back through Acts chapter 16 to 18 of his voyage that took him to Corinth, what you're going to find is that he preached the gospel and then he got beaten up to the point of almost dying. Went to another town, he preached the gospel and he got imprisoned. And as he's going on his way to Corinth, the two people that are closest to him, Silas and Timothy at that point, they go on to do ministry elsewhere. And when he comes to Corinth, which everyone knows, if you're going to go to the city of Corinth, we said about this in the first one, you go into the city that's most likely going to be in the most opposition to holy God. And he comes in and he's not the preacher that I think a lot of people are going to gather around and really lift up because he is, he is scared. And in fact, we know that he is scared because the Lord has to visit him again in Corinth. The Lord Jesus comes to him again when he's in Corinth, when he starts to minister and Jesus says this to him. Don't be afraid, don't be afraid, but keep on speaking and don't be silent. For I'm with you and no one will lay a hand on you because I have many people in this city. It seems that Paul had much of a fear if I preach the gospel here, what's going to happen to me this time? Paul had to be encouraged in the message he believed in and not only so, but he had to be encouraged of its effects that the gospel message, when preached, it has the power to save people. And Paul needed that encouragement because the temptation that Paul is facing in his weakness, in fear and in loneliness, was the temptation of preaching like everyone else who was a speaker back in the day, who could gain a following, to speak in a popular way so as to get a hearing. You see, in Paul's day, a public speaker or whatever, it was, kind of like, it was kind of like the TV or maybe scrolling through your phone and looking at your little reels, right? It was, it was entertainment back then. So you would, could purchase a speaker and there was different amounts you could purchase them for depending on their skill and level and ability. And you'd come and have them in your house and you'd get all your family and friends over and it was a bit of a do and you'd sit down and you'd listen to this person speak and they were so eloquent and so persuasive. And in Greek philosophy, you've got people like Aristotle who really majored in how to win an argument. Doesn't matter if you're right, doesn't matter if you got all the facts, it was just the way in which you spoke. You could win people through the way that you talked to your story or to your point of view. And this was the people in Corinth that were speaking and Paul had a temptation to be like that to be someone who used human wisdom or persuasive techniques to gain a hearing. Just, uh, just this week, uh, my wife sent me a, uh, a message of a TED talk um, by a guy named William Stevens. And, and in his TED talk, he doesn't say anything the whole time that is remotely helpful about anything. And that's his whole point because what he shows you is that the inflections in your voice and the intonations that you can do with your voice can capture people. And so he's sitting there and he goes, if I raise my voice, it seems important. But then if I lower it and give it a pause to think deeply about nothing, because I'm not actually saying anything of value. And he's showing that people get won over by this kind of charismatic kind of preaching and talking. It's captivating to us. I can happily uh, confess to you that when I came here to do my preaching before the church voted me in, I had this tension within me. So I want to preach in a way that you would like me, that the vote would go in my favor. 
I can happily admit that that was there. And I struggled for a very long time to find a scripture verse to pick because the easy one you'll do is pick a heartwarming verse, right? And they actually teach you this in university on how to preach and, and preach well. And there's nothing wrong with being a good preacher. But you do learn the art of what is influential and how to speak popular. popular. You, all you've got to do is, this is the reason not many people know their Bibles, is just always select the verses that sound awesome. Right? God is for you. He's not against you. He made you the head and not the tail. And just say verses like that. They're scriptural and they're beautiful, but only preach on those ones because they're popular and they make you feel great. And when you start, the way that you'll kind of get the crowd to kind of get onto your side is I'm just going to tell you a cute, funny story. All right, get everyone laughing. That breaks down the eyes. Then I'll put some vague, more emotional side to it. So it resonates with everyone. That captivates the audience and brings it down to earth. And then that's when you pump the scripture and give all the encouragement and wound it back up. And all of a sudden, everyone's in hysteria. Everyone's hopeful. Everyone's, you know, inspired. But what did you actually get one to? I remember doing this, you know, people were talking about false teachers all the time. False teachers this, false teachers that. You know, I was like, I don't want to be a part of that. I'm going to go listen to all these people that say they're false teachers. So that was something I did for six months. I went and listened to everyone that everyone said was a false teacher to see what they were actually saying. I can tell you they're fantastic at scripture, <laughs> better than me and being able to quote it, but they can rile people up so well and give so much hope and encouragement, but it's unclear actually at the end of the day, what did they even really say? And I used to watch people's faith in these people. It would be so inspired on Monday and it was so zonked out by Tuesday. Because there was no actual nourishment for the soul. Paul had this temptation to gain a following around him. But Paul says here, he goes, I decided. I have the ability to talk like that. I could do it. But I chose not to do it. I chose just to give you the gospel to talk about what I've been given by God, and that is Jesus and Jesus crucified. And he refused the wisdom, the persuasive techniques of winning the audience over. Why, he says? So that when you believed, you believed in the gospel because it was the power of God working through you and not winning you over just because I sound fantastic. I wanted to know it was genuine. And that's why I ditched what I did when I came here. I want to know, is the church genuine or does it just want, if I can put myself still in this category, a kind of younger, hipper pastor? Because that might gain a few more people into the seats. Do you want the Lord? Do you want Lord crucified for sins that we have committed? You see, Paul refused to have a cult following for Paul because he was a great speaker in his day. Paul knows the church's faith is genuine because when they were saved, it was the Spirit of God that opened their eyes to receive the message. You know, you can go look at <clears throat> Jesus when he's speaking to the Apostle Peter. And when he, say, he sits there and he says to Peter, Peter, but who do you say that I am? Who am I to you? And Peter says, well, you're, you're the Messiah, you're the Son of God. And Jesus says to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon Peter, for flesh and blood did not teach you this, but my Father in heaven. Who opened up Peter's eyes? The Lord. It was the power of God opening the eyes of Peter. Jesus never told him who he was. He had learnt that from the Father in heaven. Brothers and sisters, there's an encouragement and a warning here. And the encouragement is, is that if you have received the gospel message of Jesus... That he has bled and died for your sins? You can have assurance that your faith is rested on God's work in you. That's the beautiful thing. If you believe, it's because the Lord has led you to that. The warning in the passage is if you're just spiritually hungry for a message from people who are going to slap the name of Jesus on things, 
and they're going to preach a message and, and just convey it in a way that makes you feel good, then you might want to consider, what do I actually believe? And I'm not down to the very core of it. Am I just in churches for hopefully this spiritual, I don't know, phenomena that's going to happen inside of me or the spine tingling goodness? Those things aren't bad, but if I'm here just for those things, what do you want to? To Christ and the gospel or to just, it sounds really nice and awesome. Spiritual maturity, it comes from God, and what God gave us to be spiritually mature in is Jesus who bled and died for our sins on a cross, that he took our place. That is the crux of everything that we hold on to. That is where wisdom flourishes and grows from, that garden bed. So we don't move on ever from the gospel. We only grow in depth and knowledge. And that pervades every other sphere of influence in our lives. Read with me now from, from 6 to 9, and it says, We do, however, Paul says, we do, however, speak a wisdom among the mature, but not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. On the contrary, we speak God's hidden wisdom in a mystery. A wisdom God predestined before the ages for our glory. None of us rulers of this age, none of the rulers of this age knew this wisdom because if they had known it, they would not have crucified, sorry, the Lord of glory. Paul wants to clarify something <clears throat> for his listeners because he just said that the gospel message is foolishness to those who are perishing, right? And the Greeks look at it as foolishness as far as that philosophical endeavor. But he says, look, I want you to know something that the gospel, just because people believe it to be foolish, it's not foolish. It's the wisdom of God. And it's actually given to the mature people who can understand it. Just because the majority of the population despises it, Paul says, it doesn't mean it's a fool's errand to go on and believe. Paul now flips the whole thing on his head and he says it is not foolishness, it's actually wisdom and I'm going to show you how it's wisdom. He looks around and he looks at the Greek philosophy at the time or, or he looks at the people that are kind of captivating audiences through their intriguing stories and their mystic insights of different spiritual knowledge. He's looking at Gnosticism which was around at that time which kind of believed in the name of Jesus but didn't believe in the bodily resurrection and they kind of mystified, they had this secret knowledge and if you got to know their personal secret knowledge then you're in the spiritual elite group and he looks around at all these different groups and he says for all that worldly wisdom that they preach and that they want to teach you where did it get them nowhere their wisdom faded out when they died and what happened to them nothing death overtook them so in the long run what wisdom was it at all it had no eternal substance in it whatsoever you see, the world loves to give you and I the wisdom that we need to live in this world. I mean, you only got to go online and flick through your YouTubes or, again, your social medias, and people will love to teach you what to value, what to appreciate, what to spend most of your day doing to live a good and proper life because apparently they're doing it too, but then when you find out is they're a bunch of frauds. But it's not just on social medias. We have politicians, right, that gain these big platforms. We give them the big platforms and half the time they're cringy. On what society should be like, how families should be, all these different things. We have activist groups that teach us what our personal identity should be or perhaps what, how we should view and understand and treat the created order. And Paul looks at all these kinds of things and he says, for all that wisdom, do they preach Christ crucified? Well, if they don't, it's not a wisdom church that you need to entertain. There was a worldly wisdom invading Paul's church at his time. If it doesn't flourish from the gospel, then what wisdom is it at all? In verse 7, Paul is drawing his listeners in, so he's just pushing back this, this kind of worldly wisdom that's coming into the church. <clears throat> he's pushed that off and said, that's, that's not wisdom at all. And then he kind of just wants to elicit response <clears throat> from the people he's talking to. He's like, I'll tell you some wisdom. Do you want to know something ancient? So ancient, in fact, only God knew about it before the creation of the world. 
You see, I can tell you something that no one has ever known. And once you know it, it'll change your life. Not just for here and now, but I can give you a wisdom that will go far into eternity. Do you want to know what that wisdom is? That God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world. That he, being God himself, took your sins and your punishment upon that cross. And that whoever comes to faith in him will have life forevermore. That is a wisdom that no one knew. No one saw it. And the reason he knows that no one saw it is he says, if anyone knew who Jesus was, they wouldn't have killed him. If they had known what the message was, they wouldn't have killed him. <clears throat> and he talks about the rulers of the age. And you can kind of take that in two ways. It's either the first way is the philosophy of the age, the human knowledge. It couldn't understand this secret wisdom that God was bringing into it through Jesus Christ. And that's why they crucified him. Other people interpret it to talk about the rulers of the age and kind of the demonic, satanic kind of side that there is the prince of this world. And that he didn't understand it and that he didn't know it and that's why he killed him. Because see, if Satan, when Satan put Christ to death, he didn't know that that was the master plan of God, that through death, Christ would triumph over Satan and triumph over sin and triumph over hell and everything else. Personally, it can be either view because when you get to Acts and Peter is expressing the will and the plan of God through Jesus Christ, he says, look, evil men with the hands of evil spiritual forces put Christ to death. No one knew what they were doing. The only person who knew what was happening at that time was God. Because you go into the letter of Peter and Peter says, when the gospel message was being, being brought into fruition through Christ, even the angels were looking in to try and figure out what was going on. See, the demons might have known that he was the son of God, but they didn't know his mission. And Paul says, this is the secret that the prophets have been talking about. They didn't fully understand it or grasp it in all its glory, but they knew something was bound to happen. This is the message. That's that secret knowledge that so many people are trying to travel the world and go find in different experiences or different cultures or different religions. They're all looking for this hole in their life to hopefully bring some purpose or some plan to them. And Paul says, it's here. And you don't need to go out and search for it. God came to you. That's the message of the gospel. I was listening to a, uh, a talkback uh, show recently, uh, like one of those late night ones. And uh, there, was a, there was a, anyway, an atheist on there who's very well known. And, and he gave his logic on, on why he believes that the, the God thing is just all delusional. And he says, well... If you were to be able to stamp out all the Bibles, all knowledge of Christianity, you know, get the men in black kind of out and, and fry everyone's brain so that they couldn't remember the Christian religion. So it was completely gone in an instant. He was like, it'd never come back. It'd never come back. And that's the exact same logic that Paul is using. Yeah, it would never come back because mankind didn't think it up. It was revelation from heaven given to mankind. That's how it entered the world. And the, the question really begs of the atheist, if no one would ever think up the Christian religion again, how did it get here? How did it get here? Someone brought it. And it was no man, it was the Son of God who came from heaven and brought it to us. You see, the uniqueness of the Christian religion upon every other religion. Every other religion will tell you how to get to God. The uniqueness of the gospel is God said, I came to you. You don't have to do anything. Trust that I came to you. Trust that I forgive you of your sins. It's the complete opposite. 
All right. The next question we've got to ask ourselves is, it's revealed in Christ, but how do we receive that invitation or receive that spiritual wisdom that, that God brought down? And the way that it's kind of been understood, if this is helpful for you at all, it was helpful for me as an illustration, was that, that kind of idea that you get in John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? That, that thought pattern, he's obviously grabbed that from Genesis, and he's putting that together, and he's saying, look, in the beginning there was, there was you know, the eternal God, but there was also the eternal Son who's called the Word, but he's kind of getting at this thought idea that when God spoke, what he was doing was he was projecting forward verbally the noise, right? And the noise carries on the wind. And wind in scripture is where we get the word spirit from. And so you have this culmination of the, the verbal knowledge of God riding on the wind. And this is, the, that, this is how we communicate or how we've come to know God. God has projected something, revealed something, into our world so that we can know him the word jesus christ through the holy spirit ministering in him is how we come into connection if that helps fantastic fellas just like muddled you all up and you're like what is he talking about just scrap it and leave it alone <laughs> all right well, we're going to get to the next part which is verses 10 through 12 and it says now god has revealed these things to us by the spirit since the spirit searches everything even the depths of god for who knows a person's thoughts except his spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now, Paul is just using a human experience here to, to show you how you can get to know God. He's saying, look, each one of you, you have an internal monologue, right? We always got something going on in here. And it's always expressing or saying something or doing something. And that's the, the inner man scripture will call it, of, of who we truly are. And so you guys could sit in the, who you truly are on the inside. What goes on up in this ticker up here? That's who you truly are. Paul says, that's, how can anyone know a person unless they reveal it to them? The only person that knows what's going on in here is the spirit within that own person. He says, so it is with God. With God, he is the only one who knows what he's thinking about. Unless he chooses to reveal that to you, how can you know him at all? If he chooses not to reveal himself, if he chooses not to speak, he can't know God. Is his illustration. Who can know the mind of God or the thoughts of God? And Paul says, well, the Spirit of God does. The Spirit of God is, is knowing the thoughts of God, and the Spirit of God is what's been given unto those who have faith in Christ, and therefore, you can have true knowledge of God, because he is communicating by his Spirit to us. In verse 12, Paul now says, we haven't received the spirit of the world. That's kind of that wisdom of the world or the persuasiveness of it. But we receive the spirit who comes from God. Who is the we? That's everyone who by faith believes in the gospel. Through that message, we are given the Holy Spirit to know and understand who God is and what he is doing. Why did God give us the spirit? Paul qualifies his statement and says that we might understand what has been freely, freely given to us. So this is the profound point. I just said it before, the whole idea that people will go on these massive endeavors to try and know God. And Paul says, you want to find someone spiritually mature who knows God? Understand that it's freely given to people. That you can know God right in your pew right now. And he wants to do that. I mean, go, go look at Jesus in, in, in Luke chapter 11. And he will say to the people there, he says, what father among you, even though you're evil, if your son comes and asks for a fish, you're going to give him a snake. Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. So if you're evil and you know how to give good things, doesn't the Holy Father want to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Do you have to do something to receive the Holy Spirit, says Jesus? No. God loves his children. God wants to give you the Holy Spirit. 
There's no works here. There's no merit here. There's no long voyage here. There is God who has come to give you a message and you can trust in him. God is your good father. If you want to find someone spiritually mature, find someone who understands grace. Unmerited favor given out to all of us freely. That person who understands that will be very humble and very patient with people because they don't have themselves on some kind of platform or plateau above everyone else. They realize that they're just like their brothers and sisters right beside them, that they're just like every other person that is lost in this world looking for something. And all they can communicate is all Paul can communicate. I received this wisdom, I received this knowledge from no man, but from Christ. And so I preach nothing else but what Christ gave to me. We have to understand that what we are looking at, though, is Paul is talking inside a church context. So there's those of the Spirit. And he says, when those people weigh up my words, sorry, I've moved on a little here. When those people weigh up my words, this is in 13, we also speak these things, Paul says, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in things taught by the Spirit. So Paul is saying, look, when I communicate to you as an apostle of Christ, I'm not just speaking to you some human thing. I'm speaking to you words taught by the Spirit to me and I'm communicating them to you by the Spirit. And if you have the Spirit, you can evaluate and know what I'm saying. And Paul looks at the church and he says, you guys who are born again of the Spirit, you can know. You can know what I'm saying is true. But then in 15, he contrasts it, or sorry, 14, The person without the Spirit does not receive what comes from God's Spirit because it's foolishness to him. It's hidden away from them. They can't receive it nor understand it because the Spirit of God is not communicating it to them. He is not able to understand or evaluate it or judge it spiritually. So Paul knows that there's people in the church that are going to reject him and he faces this a lot of times in Corinth and his words. He says, look, that's just because they've still got the Spirit of the world in them. Or people are allowing the spirit of the world to come back into the church and that's why they're not listening to the apostolic message. Now, if it sounds a bit confusing, <clears throat> I'll give a little bit of an illustration. Just due to the, the job title that I hold, when I talk to people, I always bring up that I'm a pastor. People say, what do you do for work? And I always say, oh, I'm a pastor. And it, it's always a funny experience just seeing what happens on the other end of, of that. Because uh, I don't think people know what to say, like, oh, a lot of people go to church, I don't know. Anyway, but you get different experiences, and you get them from Christians and non-Christians alike, and, and people feel like they need to share, you know, I'm, I'm a Baptist, or I'm something other, or, you know, whatever, they share a spiritual experience. And I've found with a lot of non-believers of the faith, or people that just don't have any experience with God, they like to tell me their opinions on what they think he is like, and, which is fine, and I just sit there and and listen to them. Uh, but I've started to develop a question that I ask for them after they finish giving me the spill, and I just say, oh, so you know God. And they're quite quick to tell me that they don't know God because they're not a believer. And, and I put that forward only to then ask them, like, then how do you know he's like what he's like? And it just opens up that conversation so I can keep going. But the idea is, is if, I don't know, Jeff, if there's a Jeff over there, I don't know Jeff. How can I talk on what Jeff is like and if Jeff is kind and nice, if there's a Jeff over there, hello? I can't communicate on those levels. And Paul is saying the unspiritual person, how can the unspiritual person teach on the spiritual nature of God? Can't. Can't evaluate it. Who knows the mind of God except God himself and who he chooses to reveal it to? And then Paul says the spiritual person in verse 15, that spiritual person, though, the one that has the mind of God, however, can evaluate everything, and yet he himself cannot be evaluated or judged by anyone. That's not saying that, look, you're going to go get a a speeding fine and you can look at the police officer and say, hey, look, I can't be judged by you. It's not what he's saying. He's saying on spiritual matters, an unspiritual person cannot teach you. 
I can't teach you the wisdom of God. You can note this a lot in, uh, if you like commentaries, you'll note this a lot in commentaries. There's some people who just like to kind of talk and talk and talk in books, but it's clear that it's just not gospel orientated or they're trying to take it on some theological bent that they have a predisposition to. So Paul is talking about people in the church. He has people teaching in the church and there's issues in the church and Paul knows that those issues are coming from unspiritual people trying to bring an unspiritual wisdom into the church. That's where all the fighting's happening. And it's contrary to the Spirit of God. And this is worldly wisdom. And what worldly wisdom does is it it puffs up, right? It makes you proud. I've got something here and I got it from somewhere. And Paul's trying to get rid of all that. No, you got it from the same God. It's all given to him, by him to us and it's given to all. You see, Corinth was notorious for uh, loved prophecies, right? A good spiritual word sent from heaven. It loved visions, It loved a a heightened sense of the heavenly realms kind of being brought down. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things, providing that they're truly from God. The problem was that a lot of people in the Corinth church were trying to establish their spiritual maturity as being closer to God through these enlightenments that they were having. That's how they got the platform. And this just wasn't a problem in Corinth that actually started happening across many of the churches. And you don't have to do your homework very much to see that it's, it's here in Coffs Harbour. Right? I like to survey all the different churches and hear what people are doing and listening to and what they're projecting when they speak and what they preach. And it's not to give you the, who don't want to go to the other churches. It's just realize that people want to be more spiritual than what God is actually giving them because they want you to listen to them. There's a pining for it. Paul has strong words against this kind of teaching and this preaching in Colossians. In 2, he says this, Do not let anyone who delights in false humility or the worship of angels disqualify you. That idea of disqualifying is lead you astray. Such a person also gets into all these great details about all these things that they have seen. They're all puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual minds. They've lost connection with their head from whom the whole body is growing up in God. So Paul says all these people that are having these visions, they're going through all these aesthetic practices of fasting for days on end and trying to get all this, you know, enlightenment from some thing. He says, actually, it's showing how unspiritual they are, not how spiritual they are. It's the opposite. They want this new word, this new revelation. And what their unspirituality is doing is it's cracking the people of Christ apart from the gospel message, which is the true wisdom of God. And it's taking them in all sorts of different bents and directions, and they're all following their little leaders who have these little spiritual knowledges. I'll conclude here. Paul's last words is that he says, we have the mind of Christ. Note that Paul doesn't say, I, Apostle Paul, have the mind of Christ. He doesn't say you, just you, you're the only one that has the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. We come as equals to Christ because God has freely given of his spirit to each one that believes. I am not superior. You are not superior. We come to Christ the same. And as it says in Colossians, we will grow and we will grow in maturity if we hold under this gospel. But apart from that, we will not. You know, I'm yet to see in my last church I was working with another minister and I am yet to see someone who is fully mature in the gospel of grace who just wants to study the Bible all by themselves and pray all by themselves and not be with their brothers and sisters. 
Every time I saw someone walk away from the church or walk away from their Bible studies with their brothers and sisters who was trying to sharpen their minds up a little bit too, they became arrogant and thought, well, you know what? I think I've got the right interpretation of everything. No one can teach me nothing. The, the, the Christian experience can't be done in isolation. The very foundation of worshipping God is to love one another. So how are you going to do that all by yourself reading your Bible? Because all the Bible is going to tell you to do is get back to your brothers and sisters and love one them. So you are the opposite of spiritually mature, if that's what you do. Spiritual maturity will bring you to the brothers and sisters in humility and in love and will build up the brethren. And when that happens, then the church will be something. That is why, Rod, thank you so much for your prayer. I mean, it's just the Lord's prayer and you're reflecting on it. But that's where Christ is sitting there. Look, I am in you, you are in me, and we are all one, right, in God. And when you're like that, in that unity, the world will know. Jesus says, you want the world to know that you're my disciples? They'll know it by the way that you love one another. They're not going to know it by how good your apologetics is. They're not going to know it by how well you know, I don't know, Genesis. They're going to know it when you actually start loving one another. Do you want to be evangelistic? Look at the person on your right and just love them. Because outsiders can't get it. Why do they treat the brothers and sisters in Jesus with such beauty, with such patience, with such kindness, with such grace? Because our Lord is like that with us. Because I can personally testify to who he is to me. And so I love them. And they love me. And that should elicit in the world a response to say there's something here there's some kind of wisdom that they have that I want to know about. Christ came into the world because God loves you and he took your place of punishment and he brought you to himself and you are his holy people to glorify his holy name here. Let's pray.